Our gospel lesson for the morning comes from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. If this passage of scripture is found on page 42 in your pew Bibles, if you wish to read along with me. Uh, this passage of scripture contains, for me, what is one of the hardest verses to hear in the New Testament. This is the story of the encounter between Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. Let us listen now for the word of the Lord. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down before his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs then Jesus said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed. The demon was gone. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> I just happened to see uh, Ann Stewart's parents here today. For those of you who are visiting, Ann Stewart is a beloved a member of this congregation, a scholar, a, a administrator who works at uh, uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. She wrote a book for her, she wrote a dissertation on Proverbs, I believe, is that correct, that is being published now? I'll need to talk to her after this sermon is over and read the book. <laughs> I needed her this week. Uh, we're going to start out with Proverbs. I, uh, when I worked as a, what did you say? You do? Oh my gosh, it's published. I, I need that book. If you, <laughs> thank you. Um, when I was a prison at Camp Hill Prison, I was walking through the, the prison visiting blocks because I had to visit the men on the blocks regularly. And an inmate that I knew well who was at the chapel every Sunday came walking and walked with me. He had just gotten off of his job uh, inside the prison gates. And uh, he said, by the way, I want you to know, Chaplain Myers, I started a Bible study on my block. And I said, oh, that's, that's fantastic news. His name was Dave. I said, uh, Mr. Clemmer. And uh, he said, uh, I'm leading a study in the book of Proverbs. And I, I said, Proverbs, really? He said, yeah, and uh, we've got about 10 men coming to it, and we really like it. And I said, boy, that is such good news, and I hope the group gets even bigger, and you learn so much from your study of Proverbs. And he walked his way, and I walked my way, and I thought I had an understanding of why he and his fellow inmates would like the book of Proverbs, because it contains a lot of, in my opinion, common sense knowledge, things that you just should know, and in case you've forgotten them, it reminds you of it again. Uh, and it, you can look up just about anything in, in Proverbs, and you'll find something to help you or guide you if you read the book. And I had a feeling that a number of them might be uh, talking about some passages that say, uh, stay away from wayward women, because that's what got a lot of them there in the first place. Um, but I, um, I want you to know that I have a difficulty with Proverbs, not the book of Proverbs in the, in the Bible so much as modern day Proverbs that we use today because by their very nature they can be contradictory. Uh, a man by, named Robert Fulgram, you may have heard of him, he wrote a book, a little book a number of years ago called uh, Maybe, Maybe Not, and he lists Proverbs and shows us the contradictory nature of modern day Proverbs. I was going to share a few of those with you this morning. These are some examples. Look before you leap. 
He who hesitates is lost. Two heads are better than one. If you want something done right, do it yourself. Out of sight, out of mind. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. You can't tell a book by its cover. Clothes make the man. Many hands make light work. Too many cooks spoil the broth. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's never too late to learn. Never sweat the small stuff. God is in the details. Just a few examples. Another set of Proverbs that would apply to our lesson from the Gospel of Mark this morning would be, better safe than sorry, nothing ventured, nothing gained. The Syrophoenician woman decided to disregard those who would tell her better safe than sorry and instead embraced nothing ventured, nothing gained. This Syrophoenician woman breaks just about every social norm known in the ancient Middle Eastern world at in this story that we read about. First of all, she is a female who approaches a male, the male being Jesus, and this is unacceptable in the Mediterranean world, in the ancient world, and she approaches Jesus boldly. Additionally, she is a Gentile. She is a non-Jew who boldly approaches Jesus. And this is not how women were supposed to act in this day uh, people would have told her you can't do that that is not socially acceptable what you need to do is stay at home mind your own business associate with your own kind and leave visiting dignitaries the heck alone but she didn't listen to any of them nothing ventured nothing gained was the only thing the Syrophoenician woman could think about she has a daughter, a young daughter who is very ill. She is gravely ill, and she's tried everything to help and heal her daughter. Nothing works. No physician can help her. No medicine can help her. She's heard about Jesus and the great miraculous acts he's done, and she knows that he is her only best and last hope. So she is determined to see him, and the fact that she disregards the social norms of the day indicates how desperate she is. Now, from the verses that precede this text, we know that at this point in Jesus' ministry, he is extremely popular in the Gospel of Mark. He is surrounded by people all around him. There's one story where he is so, people are so crowded around him, he can't even lift his arm to eat anything. People want a piece of him. They want to hear him teach, hear him preach. They want him to heal them or heal their, their beloved family members or friends. He can't have a moment alone because everybody wants to see him. And finally one of the disciples say, Lord, you cannot keep doing this. You have got to get some rest. And Jesus finally agrees. Someone offers their private home for Jesus to go and get some rest just for a little while so he can recharge his batteries, just a little bit of rest. This is supposed to be a secret. No one's supposed to know about it. He's got people guarding him to make sure no one gets him so he can catch a little bit of sleep somehow. The Syrophoenician woman finds out where Jesus is and she barges in wakes him from his nap, falls on her knees, and she begs him to heal her daughter who is sick. She knows this is not the way you do things in the time she lived, but she doesn't care because she's desperate. Personal pride means nothing to her. 
Social norms mean nothing to her. The only thing that matters to her is the well-being of her daughter, and she's willing to move heaven and earth to heal her daughter. And there are parents, I believe, in the congregation this morning who can understand exactly how this woman feels. When you have a, a child that is unwell, very sick, what parent wouldn't try to do everything and his or her power to make their child well. That's what parents do. That's how we are built most of the time. There's certainly some terrible parents out there, but most parents will do anything they can for their child who's unwell. I remember as a parent, when I had children who were sick, and they were really pretty sick, I would go to bed at night, and for months, I dreamt that I was a trained scientist and a physician. I'm not a trained scientist, and I'm not a physician, but I dreamt I was. And in my dreams, they were so, it was so real. And I dreamt that I had come up with the cure for my child. No one else in the world had come up with the cure for it, but I was able to do it. And then, by the light of day, I can remember my heart just sinking to my toes when I realized that everything I thought and believed was a dream. I wasn't a scientist. I wasn't a physician. I couldn't come up with the cure for my children that would make them well. But for months, I had the dream over and over and over again because I so desperately wanted to help them. Most parents think that way, and that is how the Syrophoenician woman feels. Jesus is her only hope. She doesn't know he's exhausted. She doesn't know that his tank is empty. There's nothing left for him to give. She barges in anyway and says, I need you to help my daughter. She's going to die if you don't help her. A remarkable thing ha happens Brothers and sisters, when she barges in and falls to her knees and begs Jesus to heal her daughter, Jesus refuses. He says no to her. And one of the most difficult verses for me to read or stomach in the whole New Testament is Jesus' response to the Syrophoenician woman who is on her knees begging for her daughter's recovery. Jesus said, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Let me translate that for you. Jesus says, I am a Jew. I came for my people, the Jews. I have come to bring them salvation and health and wellness. I have come for my people, not for your people. You are a Gentile. You are a dog. Jesus calls this woman and her people a dog in this passage. I came for my people, the Jews, not for dogs. Now, when I think about myself and how I might have reacted, had Jesus said these words to me, I might have done something like, you know, you can call me anything you want. You can call my people any name you want. But how dare you call my daughter a dog? She is a little girl and she is sick. 
She is gravely ill. She's done nothing to you. And you call her a dog? How dare you? I'd heard amazing things about you, the most wonderful stories, and you call my daughter a dog. The people who talked about you lied to me. They lied to me. I've wasted your time and my time too. And I would have walked out the door and probably slammed the door on my way out. To me, what is amazing in this story is the reaction of the Syrophoenician woman to what Jesus says. She does not accept no for an answer. Instead, she acknowledges that everything Jesus has said is true. Yes, he is a Jew. Yes, he was sent to save his own people to heal them and make them whole and preach to them and teach to them. Yes, he has every right to do that. And yes, she's not a Jew. She's a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She acknowledges that he is a man of great power and wisdom. Her response to Jesus is so gutsy. Listen to what she says to her to him. Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. In other words, she says, yes, you have come for your own people and you have so much. You have so much power. You can do the most amazing things. Yes, there is so much you have to give. There is so much that surely there is a little bit left over crumbs for the dogs like me and my daughter under the table. And all I want from you is a crumb. I only want a crumb, one crumb. That's all I'm asking for. And the text says that Jesus was so impressed by the faith of this woman that he said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And the text says, the Syrophoenician woman went home, found, found her child lying in the bed, and the demon was gone. What is so impressive about this story is the visibility of the woman's faith in Jesus. She would not take no for an answer. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. She believed that Jesus could cure her daughter, so she makes her case known to him and she rejects. She risks rejection and public ridicule. None of those mean anything to her. Regardless of the inconvenience and risk, she acted on her faith in Jesus. Dearly beloved, in the passage from the book of James that Joe just read, we hear James talk about the difference between cheap faith and true faith. True faith is visibly demonstrated. Let me read again these well-known words to you. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you if a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and you do not supply their bodily needs? What good is your faith? Faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The author of James distinguishes cheap faith from real faith, true faith, people who act on their faith. Real faith puts words into real actions that meets real needs. To use the current expression, real faith is putting your money where your mouth is. 
And that's what the Syrophoenician woman does in this passage from Mark chapter 7. I want you to know that yesterday this church acted in real faith at the harvest hop that happened here in Camp Hill. Were some of you here yesterday for the hop around the, the borough of Camp Hill? Uh, we had entertainment, free food, drink, activities, music, laughter, smiles for anyone who came this way so that they might know that we are here and this is a church that would love to have you come and be a part of us. Because what we do here matters and we want more people here to be involved with us to do it. And we laugh here. We cry here too if we need to. We smile here. There is joy here. There's also sorrow here. We want people to come and be able to feel that they can be themselves here and help others and be helped themselves. And yesterday, we had a lot of people who came by to see what we were about here at Camp Hill Presbyterian Church. And they saw the generosity of the group here and the happiness and the joy of the day that was a part of what we did yesterday morning. I was here and stationed myself on Market Street because that was the main drag where the action was. And I was on a corner asking people, make sure you see the tents down there, see the flags, that's Camp Hill Presbyterian Church, we want you to come, lots of things going on, draw and chalk, it's, you can do whatever you want on the sidewalks, Probably not paint, but, uh, but chalk is great, and uh, we would just love to have you here. And one woman said to me, you know, I'd really, uh, you, you're, you're, you're really nice. I'd like to uh, tell you I'm interested in your church, but I, I have to be honest. I am a Lutheran, and I love my Lutheran church. And I said, you just made my day. I love it when people tell me they love their church. Isn't that great? I'm just so glad you love your church because we want people to love our church and the church they go to. I was fully prepared when I said it'd be wonderful if you'd like to come to worship at our church uh, this Sunday or any Sunday for someone to say to me, no, I won't be there because I'm an atheist. I was prepared for that. I expected it. No one said it to me yesterday, to my surprise. But I would have said, well, I'm glad that works for you. But now you know where we are. That's what I would have said. Yesterday was acting on faith in showing our generosity, our kindness, our laughter with people who would come our way and see where we are, a block off of Market Street. So, and we were pretty sure that people would hear the music of Steve Courtney and that would draw people in. Who knew that every store on Market Street had a, a, a band and a singer? <laughs> and uh, no one stopped the traffic. So there's a lot of traffic and a lot of motorcycles, by the way, on Market Street. So you really couldn't hear. So I was sending people down with, here, you got to go here, Steve and Courtney. And I didn't know this either, but there was a bottleneck right near the coffee shop on Market Street and I found out the reason why they were giving out free wine and beer. <laughs> so we had a, a lot to compete with. Uh, when I said, well, take your beer and go right over there to that church and uh, listen, to, uh, listen to what's going on over there because uh, you'll like it over there. I remind you again of what was read in our Old Testament lesson, the proverb, and I'm reading from chapter 9. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. That's what we did yesterday at the Harvest Hop. And for those of you who may not know, this church has a casserole ministry run by the deacons, and we work in conjunction with the hospice. And whenever the hospice tells us they have a family that is caring for a dying person in their home, they need help with meals, this church provides a casserole for that family and takes it to them. Because when you have someone who's in your home and they are dying, it's hard to get to the grocery store and it's hard to make meals when you've got all, you have so much to do to keep the person you love as comfortable as possible. So this congregation literally does feed other people. 
with real food as well as spiritual food. And that's what we're called to do, to be generous. The way I like, what I like about the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman is that it flips. Jesus ends up showing her enormous generosity. He is so generous to her. And her daughter is healed and her words are heard. And we are called to act to others out of generosity, to show them kindness, to show them love, to show them laughter, to show them comfort, to show them concern. I invite you all to join with me in doing this with our neighbors and friends. Generosity, brothers and sisters, does not wait. It seizes the moment and it anticipates the future. Amen.